Welcome everybody to our old tradition. This popular program is getting even more popular with the pandemic and it was established to deepen our sense of community. Perhaps we all feel the strong need to remain connected, to know each other better. And we have responded to the demand that presentations be tipped and made available. So this is happening. Kim Holscher is taping them. Dave Teta is making sure that the recordings are getting to the office for proper transfer to the website. So thank you very much, Kim and Dave. And thank you, Carol Kerr, for publicizing these events. And today we have uh, John Eller, who will speak for about half an hour, after which there will be time for questions. So please put your name in the chat box. And when the time for questions comes, I will call on you to come and ask the question. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nani. I appreciate that. Hello, everybody. I'm John Eller. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Let me start by just talking a little bit about my upbringing, and education, and events that shaped my life. Uh, born in Kansas, but rapidly moved with the family to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And my parents were a part of the Unitarian Church in Tulsa, All Souls Unitarian was and is one of the largest congregations in our denomination. I remember being active through my parents in that church from about age seven uh, to about age 13 when we left the state. Mom and dad had an exceptionally strong community of friends within that church congregation. It was never a doubt that if my parents died in a car accident, there were 20 families that would step up and take care of myself and my three siblings, older brother Dave, older brother Jim, and younger sister Jan. It was an incredible experience. It, it set me on a course to believe in the strength of community that exists within Unitarian churches. The strong congregation was not just through church, but after church and outside of church. As a child, I remember very fondly the experiences during summertime of after church services and after the coffee hour going to Louis Pool. Louis was a very kind and generous man who opened his home and his back pool to 30 or 40 families. And uh, it was a madhouse, but everybody loved it, especially in the summer. It just built the community. It built the strength of bonds within the church. We grew up on the poor side of town in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Bad educational system, uh, marginal housing. Uh, my mother, years after uh, dad had continued his work as a public health officer in the city of Tulsa, began teaching. Her passion was to help children learn. At one point in her career, fledgling as it was, she joined a national competition sponsored by National Geographic. The focus was to generate a curriculum for teaching youth science programs in elementary and middle school. Lo and behold, she won the national competition. That turned into a invite to be a professor or a teacher at the most prestigious Holland Hall uh, private school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That allowed us to move to a better side of town. And I was thrust into attending this much against my desire. Uh, I didn't want to go to school with a bunch of pansy rich kids, uh, but having gone there and actually had my mother as a teacher, I learned the passion for learning. I learned how to compete academically. I learned to love the teachers that we had and their inspiring message. I was only there for a year and a half, but it absolutely changed my life in many ways. One of those was that a good friend of mine invited me to his house for an afternoon of play on a weekend. My parents dropped, us, dropped me off, 
shortly after being there, as is Oklahoma's norm, it started pouring rain with high winds. We couldn't go outside and play, so we messed around inside. His mother got frustrated with us and said, go see what dad can figure out for you guys to do. Well, dad was an architect. He designed and built his own home, designed and built his office across the carport from the house. What a commute, huh? You know, th two minute walk from the house out the kitchen door and into his office. His wife was the accountant and receptionist. He had two or three uh, employees that work with him regularly as, as workload demanded. Well, he challenged us. He said, guys, sit down. I've done a subdivision not far from here and there are some empty lots. Why don't you guys sit down and start drawing some ideas for how to design a home for those lots? Well, I loved it. <laughs> it, it marked me from that day forward. I thought, this is something I'd like to do. This is something I'd like to experience. So after only a year and a half in that tremendous school, we moved to San Mateo. Well, in California, the education I had in that private school was on par with California's public schools. We lived there for only three and a half years, but I had great connections to the friends I had then uh, and, and absolutely loved being in San Mateo going to Giants games, watching Willie Mays and Willie McCovey, uh, going up into the Fillmore and, and watching uh, the music scene unfold in San Francisco. Then under Richard Nixon, the EPA was formed. The national headquarters was in Cincinnati. Huh. So my dad's job took us to Cincinnati to be a part of the new Environmental Protection Agency. We wound up in a wonderful original planned community of Marymount, Ohio. Turns out that's where Ben Gale went to school, our fellow member at UUCM. And somebody, some folks have heard me tell the story. He admitted that he had a crush on my little sister <laughs> in high school. Well, anyway, Cincinnati was a great experience for me, only being there two years. Uh, but I really wasn't akin to the uh, conservative politics of the place. So I was anxious to get to the West Coast again. What I found was that the University of Oregon School of Architecture had the best curriculum that most fit my desires for education. Got to University of Oregon because they had a School of Architecture and Allied Arts, which was an umbrella. So it didn't isolate architecture. It incorporated it into collaborative work sessions and studios with interior design, landscape design, planning, as well as the fine arts, sculpture and jewelry and painting, sketching, all those things were under one roof. And all the students in that program were encouraged to take classes in every one of those disciplines, if you so desired. Well, Oregon was a great experience. After four years of being there, uh, working my tail off, my classmates and I, a couple of my best friends, decided that we were going to tour America. We bought a VW bus. We decided our route and we went to see America and the architecture and the history of it. And so we toured US and Canada uh, over two and a half months, knowing this was the last summer that we had before we became self-sustaining adults and had to work for a living. Um, we put 13,000 miles on that VW bus, had a great tour, saw remarkable architecture and bonded as friends uh, that are still friends today. Of course, I graduated in 1974. We most all remember that was in the midst of a deep recession, gas shortages, OPEC embargo, Watergate, and yes, Hank Aaron's 714th home run that tied Babe Ruth's record. <laughs> well, job one was a very small firm in Telegraph Hill. Not a great firm, not great architecture, but it was a job. It paid the rent and gave me good experience. In a small firm, you get to do a little bit of everything. So I ran prints, but 
drew drawings and designs and, and details and enjoyed it. At the end of two and a half years, the economy had rebounded sufficiently that there were rumors of lots of jobs available in the architecture area. So I made plans. First plan I made was to ask the gal I was living with at the time, Margie, to marry me. And then I headed off to art, uh, architectural tour in Europe for two and a half months. <laughs> Fortunately, she stuck around and waited for me to return. After getting home about early June, time was going on. Our anticipated date for Mary was uh, August 27th. She said, my parents are coming out, gonna meet you for the first time. Don't you think you ought to have a job? So, okay, I better get a job. So in the span of about a week, I had two job offers. I took the one that I thought would best suit me and started at a company in July, 1977 with a company called Sandy and Babcock. Two founders, two guys that I respected a lot doing really high quality design of multifamily housing. I started with them as a junior designer. I got to work on projects in Redmond, Washington and Bellevue, Washington. Uh, meanwhile, Margie and I bought a house in Oakland. And that was in 1980 that our first son was born. Ben came along at about the time that my sister Jan brought her husband from Whittier and they moved up so that Rob could become the Unitarian minister of the Oakland church. Shortly after Jan finished her seminary at Star King and asked the congregation to endorse the idea of a co-ministry, which they did. So Jan Eller Isaacs and Rob Eller Isaacs were our ministers at the Unitarian Church in Oakland for oh. a number of years. Highlights along the way were the 1981 49ers Cowboys game when the 49ers finally beat the doggone Cowboys <laughs> and then won the Super Bowl in early 1982. In 1982, my firm was involved with a remarkable project with an interesting history. It's called Fisher Island, 220 acre island, mostly man-made off of South Beach, Miami. A man named Carl Fisher had developed a number of hotels along South Beach and he chose to assist in, in uh, dredging what they call government cut, which is a big boat access to the port of Miami. He took the spoils from that dredging and added to an existing sandbar and made the island. He huh. built a house on the island for himself and lived there for a number of years, invited a variety of well-known entertainers and wealthy people, including William Vanderbilt and his wife. Well, Vanderbilt fell in love with the island the Vanderbilts had arrived at the island, which was not connected by roadways, on a 160-foot steamer yacht that the Vanderbilts owned. Well, Fisher fell in love with the yacht. On a handshake deal, they swapped the boat for the island. <laughs> that was 1925. In 1930, the Vanderbilts built a family complex, a mansion, airplane hangars so they could fly their seaplane to the island. Uh, they developed it with a series of casitas to allow family and guests to come and visit the island. And it stayed that way pretty much until the 60s. Well, a couple of well-known guys, investor people bought the island. B.B. Rebozo and Dick Nixon, you may recognize those names, were the investors in 1963 that bought that island. In 1982, my firm was engaged in the master plan and design for 1,000 high-end condos and uh, retail areas and conversion of the airplane hangar to a spa and a variety of things that eventually uh, made that island the highest price zip code in America. The hmm. average income of owners there was $2.5 million a year in 2015. Oprah Winfrey, Dan Rather, Andre Agassi, Boris Becker, the tennis players, uh, oh. among the residents of this remarkable uh, development. That was one of the projects that we did. I was more involved with things local. 
uh, Foster City did an apartment project. It was interesting, it was a school site that had been held in abeyance for a high school. Uh, the demand for students was not there. So they put the land up for auction and a fellow young man named Land Benson was the successful bidder. He was the son of Lloyd Benson, Senator in Texas. Uh, we built 490 apartments in that project and it was a delight to get to know Land and, and uh, quite a gentleman that he was. 1984, Margie and I moved to San Rafael. We were in the Glenwood neighborhood uh, out east of town and our son Matt was born. That was a time where things were starting to get thin. Domestic markets were tough. In 1986, we had our first opportunity and I was invited to interview for a project in Takihara, Japan. Uh, it was a resort project, multiple hotels, multiple golf courses, golf clubhouses, spas, plus housing clustered around the golf courses. Our client was only 34 years old as the local development uh, director, but one of the nicest people I've ever met. Delightful young man who wanted to vest us in understanding the culture of Japan, the expectations people would have when they came to the hotels, how they wanted to be treated when they went to the golf clubhouse to play some golf. Uh, great experience. It generated my first love of Japan and the people there. From there, projects took us throughout the Pacific Rim because that's where the opportunities were. Multiple projects in Jakarta, Indonesia, projects in Taipei with another fabulous client who actually in his Anglo name went by Charlie Chan, uh, great guy. We did projects in Kuala Lumpur, Manila uh, and other places. I spent a lot of time in Hong Kong and Singapore 10 days a month was an average amount of time on the road, traveling, meeting clients, satisfying their needs uh, for a number of years in the 1986 to 1995 timeframe. In 88, I got a phone call. It was a headhunter. He was looking to recruit someone with my experience to a firm in North Beach. The founder was getting old and wanted to find a replacement. Boy, that was a nice firm, really good people, loved the conversations with them. And I had said, yes, I would join that company, full well believing that my current company in San Francisco would say, okay, have a good time, see you later. They didn't, they said, you gotta stay. Uh, we want you to stay. We're gonna call you our chief executive offer, chief executive officer, and we will match the offer from the Newport Beach firm. Well. That was good news to me. I really didn't want to be in Southern California. Didn't want to raise our boys to be Southern California kids. <laughs> so we stayed. It was a tough economics, a lot of work in the Orient, uh, a lot of people competing for that work. Most of our consultant friends said, survive to 95, survive to 95. Well, they were absolutely right. The domestic market picked up again in 95 and into 96. Because of the experience of struggling so much, losing some of our staff, uh, we needed to diversify. So I moved us into hospitality. The first step into hospitality was to go into timeshare design. And my first job was the Hilton Company starting their new timeshare division with a, with a guy who I considered the grandfather of timeshare, fabulous client, guy named Ed McMullen. We did a project on land behind the existing Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. It was great fun because Bugsy Siegel, the first developer of Las Vegas, his last remaining structures were behind the Flamingo Hotel. Well, we were gonna use that site to build a new multi-dimensional pool and our timeshare project. We had bets with a contractor, how many skeletons we might find in Bugsy's foundations or perhaps treasure, none of which turned out to be true. It was a, it was a great fun project, uh, got that done. And that led to a relationship with Marriott Vacation Club. 
we did projects in Palm Beach, Phoenix, Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, and loved every minute. Marriott Vacation Club was one of my best clients, good friends across the board, uh, great collaborations, always heads up looking for the best possible design. Then local, we got lucky and, and picked up a project at Bay Meadows, the old horse track. The, the practice track became an opportunity and we wound up doing 500 apartments on that property in San Mateo. And then we moved into the opportunity for mixed use development. So for us, architecturally, mixed use was retail on the ground floor and housing over the top. My hope is that we'll see more and more of that kind of development uh, in areas. Northgate's a great opportunity for such a thing. I was one of a, a, a group of architects doing separate projects within a master plan at Santana Row in San Jose. Really proud of the work that we did there. Uh, but one day in the meeting with another project and developer, uh, I got word and they got word that my project was under fire. An 11 alarm fire torched the project and no one was hurt, but it set us back many, many years and needed to go through a rebuilding process to return the project to its onward momentum. 1997, I was given the opportunity to buy in as a partner and started the process of buying out the two founders, Don Sandy and Jim Babcock. Sandy and Babcock was the name of the company that I joined in 77 and would stay until I retired in 2010 with that company. Well, in 2000, we got calls from a <clears throat> firm in Shenzhen, China. They had visited and loved our project called Fisher Island, I mentioned earlier, and wanted one like that for themselves in China. <laughs> they called it Dreamtown. We did the master plan and, and built 4,000 units of housing and 600,000 square feet of commercial space. The amazing thing about that project, I love to tell the story, the Chinese are diligent and hardworking beyond our imagination. Mm -hmm. The developer there hired three contractors and asked them to work 24 seven. So the first phase of the project, which was 725 units and a half a million square feet of commercial space, from the time we finished our technical drawings, which were not documents for construction because the Chinese local architects did that, six months later, the first phase was ready for occupancy. Wow. Six months. Wow. <laughs> In America, it would take probably two and a half, three years for that same process to be achieved. And the product was exceptional in the quality of what they delivered. Absolutely amazing. We also got to work on a project uh, that you might know, it's called Bay Street over in Emeryville. We did all the housing for that project. There's townhouses that view the bay uh, along the, the, the Western edge, and then uh, four story, five story apartments on the other side. A really interesting project, really challenging, uh, and, uh, and yet one that uh, we're proud of. We did a project called the 88, with San Jose's tallest high rise residential. Uh, but towards the end of my career, the project, one of the projects I was most proud of was ca called the Strata. And it's an apartment project in Mission Bay in San Francisco. And the thing that I was proud of was that I had convinced a client friend, we'd done multiple projects before. I said, look, we need to do this project and we need to do it right. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take you, the entire design team, all of the engineers, my architectural team, and you're gonna identify the contractor early on, hire him on a negotiated bid basis. And we're gonna have that whole team assembled. And based on that, then we're gonna meet and we're gonna build the project on paper. So based on the concept design, really not much more than a napkin drawing uh, that I and my team had prepared. We met with the entire team 
and we built it over a period of four days on paper. Mm -hmm. Then we did the construction drawings. Then we got the permits. Then we built the project. And over that process, what was exceptional, you expect 5% of change orders, maybe 10% on a, on a bad project. We had half of 1% in change orders. And at the end of the day, everybody were still friends and everybody acknowledged the process, acknowledged the, the, the working together, the collaboration had been a tremendous success. My last design project, was to transition myself out of the firm to design the next generation. I'd worked on it over many years. I had six junior partners that I had brought from outside and promoted from within, ready to take over when I retired. That was a big deal for me. And I felt it was a tremendous success and they continue to be a successful firm today based on the partners that we put in place. In retirement, my first desire was to play. My first desire was to do something uh, that, that I had not been able to do for the 38 years of my career. And that was to get up in the morning and not know what each day was gonna have, mm -hmm. to pursue new adventures. So one of my passions was early on wanting to do more in the Bay Area to foster opportunities for affordable housing. So I joined a group called the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative and worked hard for a number of years to help bring education to the community about the issues surrounding affordable housing. I also joined the Marin County Planning Commission. In 2013, I was appointed as a commissioner to the county. Uh, nearing eight years of that at this point uh, and looking forward to uh, resigning that position and moving on. I also joined a group called SUR, which is a great bunch of guys. SUR stands for Sons in Retirement. It's really a dedicated group gathering to make friends and have fun together. Uh, activities like bocce ball or bowling or a Valentine's party for the spouses and the guys in the club. Uh, that's been a great connection for me and I've really enjoyed it. In fact, I had Ted Gaber set up to join. Uh, of course, then the pandemic hit, so we couldn't uh, gather for the group. Margie and I have always enjoyed travel, but with retirement, it ramped up and we, we set ourselves a course to get out and do adventure travel. Before retirement, one of my favorite things in the world is tennis. And I really wanted to fulfill a lifelong dream of going to Wimbledon. Well, in 2008, we were there, center court, watching Rafa Nadal beat Roger Federer. Oh. Considered, considered probably the best tennis match ever held. Wow, yes. <laughs> and we were there for that and loved it. We rafted the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. Uh, we. We seem to love islands. We've gone to the Caribbean, Hawaii, Nantucket, uh, various places. Margie's bucket list letter to other hikers had recommended the Tour de Mont Blanc. You start in Chamonix, France, you hike down into Italy, you hike to Switzerland, and then back into France. 120 miles in 12 days, up over passes, down to little villages, staying in these wonderful hotels a trip of a lifetime. Top of my list was New Zealand. We did a month long multi-sport adventure in New Zealand, North and South Island. We love the American national parks have done Alaska and Glacier and Bryce and Zion, Yosemite, Sequoia, Olympic, on and on for the American national parks. Being in nature is truly a part of my religion. Australia, especially Tasmania, Greece, and most recently Japan. So now it's hiking, biking, kayaking, tennis, maybe bowling if they ever open the, the lanes again. That keeps us busy. And, and that takes me to UUCM and our connection there. Well, we were at a wedding. My niece, Hannah, Jan and Rob Eller Isaacs, youngest, 
was getting married in Minnesota. We were there. And a long-term friend of the church and my parents in particular, uh, Laurel Leifert came over to say hello <laughs> and said, I really want you to check out the congregation in Marin because my son Marcus is the minister there now. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a year ago. <laughs> like everyone else, we fell in love with Marcus and his unbelievable talent and, and connection to people. And so here we are a year later as new, relatively new members of UUCM. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> That was such a beautiful speech. And <laughs> Thank you. Questions. I now have, a, I have Jim Harrison with the first question. Yeah. Go, so, Jim. Um, I was really curious when you went up to Oregon, yeah. you first got really your feet into architecture. Did you start out with some particular um, type and volume, you know, did you want to do big office buildings then? Did you want to do housing? What, what did you want to do? I, my, yeah, Jim, my affinity was always with housing. And mm -hmm. fairly early on, I fell in with professors uh, who also shared that passion. And, and so uh, I, I sort of chased housing all along. But uh, not single family so much. I never, I did, I did one single family house in my career. Is that for, the one you're in? That's oh, all. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kim, did, did you, was it you, Kim Hosher, who asked the question about raising his sons as Northern Californians? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Tell your question again. Uh, you mentioned that you didn't want them to grow up as Southern Californians, so you were happy to stay in the Bay Area. So what did you mean? How did you raise your sons and what do they do now? Uh, well, uh, my older boy, Ben, is, is a teacher who is taking a break to pursue a master's degree at Harvard um, in education uh, with a focus on counseling. Um, the younger son, Matt, uh, is in tech, he and his wife both. Uh, he's in San Francisco and uh, doing extremely well with uh, a company in San Francisco. So uh, what does it mean? Well, San Francisco to me has always had people who are more genuine, more authentic. People in, in Southern California tend to be more surface and style oriented. And, and these are all horrible stereotypes, I recognize. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, Newport Beach is a really pretty area. Uh, we had picked out a house that we would have been very happy to be in, uh, but the culture there is just different. And I'm much happier having the boys in Northern California. Thank you. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was involved with affordable housing groups here in Novato. And I was very happy to hear that you are interested in those issues as well. Yes, making a difference as we say. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, go. Uh... It's Jim. Jim, yes. John, uh, amazing, amazing uh, journey. Um, you know, so many different parts of it, but transcending uh, what seemed like uh, uh, schools that weren't so strong. But what I was really taken with was you're taking tours uh, for architecture. I'd like to know, like, what, what are some of the most favorite buildings that, mm -hmm. that you have seen? Well, of course, we, we, um, we had different experiences. And, and for you all, I will say that one of my favorite buildings was Frank Lloyd Wright's Oak Park Unitarian Church. Oh. Wow. Unity Church. Going to a service on a Sunday, I was in tears. Mm -hmm. The combination of the building and being in a Unitarian service that I, I hadn't been in for a number of years at that point. Uh, it, was, it was really a, a, a deeply mm -hmm. emotional experience. There is an architect that not a lot of Americans know. His name was Lewis.
Khan. Oh, yes. Out of Philadelphia. Yep. And truly one of my, just two of his projects are some of my favorite buildings in the world. One is uh, the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful museum filled with natural light, specifically based on the fact that each uh, showroom or display space is housed in a cycloid arch with a butterfly uh, deflector at the apex of that arch, letting through a skylight, natural light be diffused perfectly against the underside of that arch and onto the artwork. It's just stunning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a beautiful, beautiful museum. And it, it tells a story of the structure and what it's intended to do. His other project was the library at the Exeter Academy. Exeter yeah. being one of the foremost uh, Northeast uh, prep schools that, that feed to Yale and, and Harvard. The, the library there is a square donut uh, <laughs> with a beautiful atrium space in the center, the stacks, and then a whole layer of outside against windows that is a reading area with beautiful, comfortable chairs. And so the place is filled with light. It's also filled with opportunities for uh, individual reading time against a window with a beautiful view to the outside. Uh, there was another architect whose library I was very fond of uh, and his Finnish experience, he's Alvar Alto. Uh, Finnish designer, and he did a uh, fabulous library, again, filled with natural light uh, mm. that was in uh, uh, Mount Hood, Oregon, and uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Mm. So, um, you know, visiting the places on the tour uh, included those, a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright stuff, uh, Spring Green, Wisconsin, uh, Johnson Johnson Wax uh, headquarters, uh, famous places, uh, Unitarian Church in Philadelphia that he designed, leaked like a sieve, uh -huh. sort of like the Civic Center, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but, a, but a beautiful, beautiful church. Mm -hmm. Now, beyond that, it was a lot of uh, architects that were housing oriented. Uh, there was a firm called MLTW out of San Francisco. They were responsible for the master plan and design of Sea Ranch. And mm -hmm. Bill Turnbull, one of the principals there, uh, was a good friend of one of my favorite professors. And uh, that was where I'd hoped to work when I graduated. Mm -hmm. I interviewed there in 1974. As I walked in the door, Bill Turnbull and the managing architect, Bob Simpson, were gathering the staff saying, well, we don't have enough work to keep everybody. But mm -hmm. if you want to go half time, we'll do that for you. I'm sitting there with my resume and application in hand thinking, this ain't going to work. <laughs> so, but. Yeah, that place and do. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a beautiful life. Yeah. Absolutely. Did nothing, bad, did nothing bad ever happen? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, my 16 year old son was diagnosed with a massive tumor on his spine at age 16. Oh. We, got, we got a call. Uh, at home, Margie got the call first. I got the call next. Uh, need emergency surgery. He's at risk of getting paralyzed. Uh, the neurosurgeon is waiting for you at Marin General. Get over there as soon as possible. And oh, by the way, call your son, break the news to him and tell him he has to go to Marin General to be checked in. So, uh, yes, we got there. Uh, and the best analogy I've come up with is that we got on the elevator at the 100th floor. And it, it broke and free fell until after midnight when the doctor came out and said, no paralysis, we got it all. It's a benign tumor, everything's okay. Oh boy. So oh, what it was story. like we fell for a hundred floors and then it caught the doors open and we were told everything's okay. Go ahead and get off the elevator. That's kind of what it felt like. 
Oh, what a story. Yes. But he's doing well now. Nani, I noticed a lot of people, or several people anyway, are raising hands rather yes. than using the chat. Oh, so you yeah, can see them. Call on the hands. All right. There's no none other on the. Um, I, I have a question, Ginny. Yes. I yes. do too. <laughs> yes. All right. Go. <laughs> I'm interested in something I saw recently about giant printers being able to print homes, small units, housing units. And mm. I don't know what you think is the potential for that to be some kind of a partial solution to the housing crisis in, in the San Francisco area. Uh, well, two things. One, uh, the, the amazing sort of 3D printing is an increasing technology, um, doing things of significant size, like accessory dwelling units. Uh, is that some way of solving the problem of making affordable housing available in Marin County? As far as I'm concerned, absolutely not. It, it's a Band-Aid, it's a politically acceptable thing that the supervisors can point to and say, we encourage it. <laughs> And there are new laws across the state that encourage accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units. <clears throat> but they don't typically go to affordable housing. Uh, they, they go to an in-law, <clears throat> go to a granny unit. And, and it's just a small, small percentage that could be available for affordable housing. So it falls way, way short of where the county and the state should be in terms of providing not just affordable housing, but market rate housing to make it more available across the board for everybody. Thank you. Okay, Thomas, and I do have a few more names on the chat list now. Thomas. Okay, so I grew up in Chicago and there was a Frank Lloyd Roby house near our church. Yeah. And that was a beautiful house. But also I loved the idea of putting commercial on the ground floor and housing over top. And we have a number of one story um, shopping areas in Terra Linda right now that could easily have housing on top. And I wonder what you thought about that. Well, there are communities in Marin that have a fabulous history and fabric of community that are just that. Uh, look at downtown San Anselmo. Uh, they're, you know, one and two story over retail in the downtown San Anselmo area that were propagated by the train lines. And so the history came from that. Uh, at the same time, um, frankly, to succeed in those financially, you need a higher density of residential. So the one story over retail or even two-story over retail. Uh, Miller Avenue has a new project uh, in Mill Valley that uh, is very attractive, uh, but small, and under uh, you know, scrutiny feels short of the mark because it's, it's two stories over retail. It's a nice project, looks good, uh, but frankly, we need to be able to tolerate a higher density yes. where the areas that exist for opportunities and three and four stories of housing over retail provides a very nice scale to the street and, and very active. Our Santana Row project is considered yeah. an international example of how that can be done and done well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Northgate I, Mall I, might be a candidate because the mall is losing money and losing tenants. Yes. And it does have a second story already, but yeah. there's plenty of room for building more on top. Right, and, and if you do structured parking to consolidate the underutilized land where it's surface parking, a la Northgate, then you can, you can make sites for a very small amount of money. Uh, build structured parking and put housing on top and around it, uh, which is what we did at Santana Row, 
And yeah. Northgate is very much, Thomas, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a yeah. good opportunity for that kind of housing. Yeah. I, I loved hearing you emphasize density. John. Because I think there's something about American tradition that doesn't like the, that doesn't like to increase the density compared to European housing. It seems that we've been about well, it, that. John, I just want to comment on thank. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you? Oh, she unmuted can. me. Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, John. It just it's because you've been talking about being a Unitarian your whole life. And part of the thing, when you, I met you in March, that was part of the wonderful thing. Hmm. We all joined together and Ginny and Jerry, and I, I'm just, you did an incredible job tonight. And it <laughs> feels so good to relate the Unitarianism to different buildings. Do you understand? Yes. That it really, I, I felt it. I grew up in Tennessee with different, good for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I have a question from Kat. Uh, hi, John. Hey, Kat. Um, my question is, uh, what are we really going to do to make progress with affordable housing? Uh, I don't know if you watched our AUW program last week on racism in Marin. I don't know what, I'm sure we've never seen any racism because we have the white privilege benefit. Right. But, uh, you know, Marin City, uh, they're there because they were, it's Ill, it was illegal. In fact, one of my African-American friends told me uh, the early residents who were African-American, their houses were burned down. That's an example of how friendly we are at Marin. Yeah. So uh, I know you're exposed to the realities of the politics here. And I wonder if you have any hope um, you know, I think there's a lot of effort moving in the right direction. And part of that's coming from the state and uh, new uh, laws that are working hard to streamline the approval process for housing that is affordable. So for instance, there is a project coming up uh, in Marin that is trying to abide by the prescriptive design guidelines that will avoid public hearing. So public hearings give, unfortunately, uh, resistant neighbors the opportunity to uh, create obstacles to moving ahead, making affordable housing extremely uh, expensive and very difficult and time consuming. The name um, is right. And um, it, it is, I think, a, a good effort on the state's part to uh, try to expedite those approvals to make those housing units available. Now, I'm sitting on a committee right now that is working for Marin County to help develop those prescriptive uh, elements that if you basically check the boxes for all these things, then you can avoid public hearings, you can avoid, avoid detailed environmental review. There are exceptions controlled for historic uses, historic buildings, and all kinds of other factors. But if you check all these boxes, you can move quickly through. So there's hope. And I, I think it's encouraging they're doing it to allow for this process to move quickly, making the opportunity for affordable housing more real. And it's been over decades. I mean, it's a decade and a half, I think, since Marin County built an affordable project in the county land. And that's disgusting. That's just, that's a, inexcusable. Well, do we have any land where people can build? We sure do. It's just a matter of the owners of the land uh, accepting that it is an opportunity. Um, Thomas brought up Northgate. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a mixed use project in Northgate parking area wanting to happen. Uh, the seminary project is looking uh, they've submitted their plans uh, that will include inclusionary affordable housing uh, that's probably going to be in the 50 to 60 units of affordable housing as a part of that project. Now, the approvals for that are years away. The environmental impact report is going to take a year and a half, but there will be affordable housing in that project. At the seminary, is that what you're saying? Yeah, seminary here in my backyard. 
<laughs> well, thank you. It's good to see, good to hear that in your retirement, you've chosen to fit in our mission statement, <laughs> make a difference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, we have a Trevor Palacio at our next next meeting, November thirteenth. Uh, please send me names of members whom you would like to be invited. And thank you all again for coming and for speaking and for keeping this tradition alive.